Hello, and welcome to Game Media Industries. This subject is designed for students studying media and communication at the University of Wollongong, and it investigates the emergence of game media industries as a key element of the global creative economy. In this subject, we analyse games from the perspectives of players, developers, studios and publishers, situating them within a continuum of human play activities and media entertainment industries. Previous knowledge about games is not required at all for this subject, and it will provide an inclusive learning environment for students whose knowledge of the game industry is peripheral and less participatory. Students undertaking this subject will examine a range of potential topics, including the trajectory of game design from its earliest form of, el of electronic and digital games to contemporary experiences such as mobile apps, esports, board games, and live streaming. Students are going to acquire practical skills in game media production by working individually and collaboratively on digital artifacts specific to the game industries. The core learning assessment strategy for this subject is the digital artifact, which is a self-directed project of research and practical experimentation in multiple media and communication technologies. The digital artifact for this subject will be focused on producing an analysis of game media texts or paratexts using an appropriate analytical framework built from concepts and ideas drawn from the subject lectures and readings. To get a sense of how other students have approached this task, you can visit the subject blog where you will be sharing your own work. I'll put the link in the description below, but you can also just go straight to gamecultures.blog. So let's have a look at the, um, the, the learning outcomes uh, for the subject. On successful completion uh, of the subject, you will be able to engage in research to critically analyze game media texts and discuss implications and issues within the global game industries. You'll be able to present uh, a critical analysis of a digital game or game media practice, and you'll be able to demonstrate digital literacies in the preparation and delivery of a public digital artifact addressing a topic relevant to the games industries. So what is game media? A more traditional approach to game studies might begin with a definition of what games are. This typically involves a series of logical steps detailing what counts as a game and what doesn't, but that is not what this subject is about. We are not only interested in games as objects, but also the ecosystem or media ecology, which exists because of games. And so our focus for the subject is the broader topic of game media. We will be discussing specific games and their design principles, but this will be framed within broader thinking of um, theories and ideas about audiences, about communities related to games, about topical issues like the intellectual property involved in games and game texts. We'll be thinking about the way in which games and game media represent, and we'll be talking about uh, games in terms of their contribution to knowledge production, and so on. The important thing to think is that Game media is an umbrella term. It's a really encompassing um, description of diverse and multiple elements that are part of the games industry's current global success. So when we talk about game media, we're talking about the hardware layer. We're talking about the, the physical and the material components of playing video games and computer games and board games. So we're talking about um, the material objects. We're talking about the consoles, the computers, the controllers, the chips, the mobile phones, even the internet servers and the cloud storage that enables digital distribution and social interaction through multiplayer online. When we talk about game media, we're also talking about the software layer. So we're talking about the apps, the code, the platforms, and the programs which operate to provide players with game experiences. 
So, obviously then, game media also refers to the content layer. The games themselves, the presence of visual and sound design, the character and level design, as well as, of course, the embedded narrative and world building that shapes and enhances the player's experience. Game media also involves a promotional layer, uh, which encircles the hardware and the software layers. It encircles and is kind of part of the content layer. And this includes everything from advertising, merchandising, marketing, journalism, criticism and review which all support the consumer's experience and their understanding and awareness of the current state of the industry and its products. This brings us to another important layer, which of course is the cultural layer. This is the production of blogs, wikis, online videos, uh, Facebook groups, podcasts, YouTube videos, Twitch streams, and of course the massive amount of social media discussion that happens on Discord servers, uh, on Steam uh, reviews, um, and, and this is part of what we will talk in depth in this subject um, of the, the part of the, the participatory media and the participatory culture that is part of the contemporary experience of games that everyone, even casual players, experience by um, playing games in, in, at any level. So one of the primary goals uh, of the subject is to teach you how to research and analyze games media with specific attention to the industrial modes of production, distribution, and reception and to recognize that these are not discrete, but overlapping categories. The industry, uh, of uh, particularly the games media industry, does not simply refer to the manufacture of hardware or the production of games. When we talk about the games media industry, what we're actually referring to is a creative industry. I'm going to unpack what that term creative industry means in a second. But first, I think it's important that we dig into the idea of what an industry is and, and where, does that, um, where does that history come to us from. So you've probably heard of the, the notion of um, Fordism. So the word industry is typically associated with mass production, mass labor, and the principles of Fordism. Henry Ford was an American industrialist who founded the Ford Motor Company, one of hundreds of small automotive producers operating at the start of the 20th century. Ford did not invent or create the production line. Rather, he saw its potential and he used it to transform the automobile, the car, from a rare luxury good into a mass-produced commodity. He made the car reasonably, at least much more than it was, affordable. He turned the automobile into the car, a personal transport convenience which fundamentally changed the world. Other industries existed, of course, prior to this innovation because the core production of goods and services was fundamental to the organizing principles of society that emerged out of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. It was Fordism, however, these principles of mass production that epitomized uh, manufacturing by standardizing parts, by decreasing assembly costs, and reducing the role of individuals and experts in the production of goods. Uh, a factory line meant that you could replace individual workers and you wouldn't lose the knowledge invested in those workers. You know, of course, this is a, this is a very dehumanizing um, uh, and despecializing um, uh, phenomena, but it's an important one to, to recognize that is at the center of, of what we think of as, as being industry. So manufacturing became the most important industry in the, in the globe um, in the 20th century building on the coal, the steel, and the agricultural industries, and having this major effect of reducing the costs of consumer goods. The affordability of cheaply produced goods became synonymous with lower wages, but also a linear production chain. 
The creative industries uh, is an important term because this system of mass production and standardization was adopted universally. It was applied to publishing. It was applied to music and television and film and radio and marketing and advertising and sports and the performing arts and other cultural works that contribute to the economy. Together, this um, combination of creativity and industrial production became known as the creative industries. The creative industries now include a really broad range of activities which contribute to local, national and global economic progress through the commercialization of knowledge, information and obviously expression or creativity. In his book, The Rise of the Creative Class and How It's Transforming Work, Leisure and Everyday Life, Richard Florida in 2002 observed that the creative industries have become part of the process of shifting from material production to knowledge production. This, of course, was made, made possible by the information era, particularly the, the post-1995 uh, internet era. And Florida argued that because of these technological breakthroughs, human creativity really became the ultimate economic resource. And it became clear over the past two decades that creativity, innovation, knowledge, and imagination are going to be the major contributors to the global economy of the 21st century and beyond. There's an interesting definition um, of the creative industries provided by the Queensland University of Technology, QUT. And um, they describe the creative industries as innovation-led, knowledge-intensive, and highly exportable. This is, this is a, a really interesting um, kind of definition or, or set of concepts that belong to how you might understand the, the creative industries and, and whether you're thinking, okay, what, what's in a, what is a creative industry and what isn't? A creative industry demonstrates um, uh, these elements. Um, QUT also argues that the, the creative industries contribute to cultural diversity, social inclusion, environmental sustainability and technological advancements. And so you can see some of the, the, the underlying politics involved um, in this term, which are also quite interesting. So let's, let's um, narrow our focus now and start to think about games as a global industry. And I'm not going to just talk about games because I think it's important to talk rather about games media. So we're not just talking about the individual game itself, but we're talking about the enormous um, industry, the game media industry that fits under that umbrella that we were talking about before. So games media is one of the largest contributors to the, the creative industries globally. There are major national centers of production, of course, in America, in Japan, Korea, China, UK, and across Europe, but also in smaller countries like Australia and New Zealand. We do um, you know, a reasonably uh, big trade in um, game media production. This means that game media has been a major driver of globalization, not in just... Uh, hardware terms, right, because, you know, most of our hardware is produced in China and Korea and distributed around the world, but in terms of what we might think of as intercultural flow between the West and the East, particularly between Japan and the US from the 1990s, uh, sorry, 1980s onward. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in lectures um, uh, in the future. The global games media industry is an enormous power engine of capitalism, with China rapidly becoming the most profitable market, specifically in the mobile sector. Here, uh, we can see, you know, kind of comparison to uh, the, the movie industry, which is probably the other large historical cultural media industry um, that's useful to, to compare games against. So Variety.com reports um, in 2018 a record-breaking year for box office revenues in the movie industry with $41 US billion 
uh, in global ticket sales. Now, that's just ticket sales alone. According, so that's that's not you know taking into account um, you know DVD uh, streaming services. And that's just that's just pure ticket. So, but let's put that in comparison to the Ibis World figures from the. Uh, the global movie industry, home entertainment revenue. So all of this, all of um, the kind of ways to consume home entertainment. So that's that's including, uh, you know, crossover into Netflix and um, television and things like that, cable. In its entirety, the global movie industry home entertainment revenue, according to uh, Ibis World, uh, in 2018, was approximately 136 US billion. And I'm not sure exactly how reliable these figures are, but it gives us a good kind of marker to think about contextually. Comparatively, the games industry biz uh, study they put the games industry worth 135 US billion. Um, in 2018, with with revenues growing by over 10%. Uh, the mobile games industry, it, just the mobile sale, so, so you're looking at mobile apps, you're looking at microtransactions in, in mobile apps, that kind of thing. Games industry biz are putting the mobile games industry revenue at about $63 billion. So that's almost half of the the total profit from the the games industry just in mobile games uh if we if we dig into the figures mobile games account for the bulk of the industry's revenue 47 percent worth 63 billion and and that's that was up 12.8 percent year on year so these figures will be much higher this year and, and probably much higher at the, at the time you're listening Smartphones, of course, are leading the way with revenues of up to fifty billion, uh, while tablets, interestingly, account for uh, eleven point four billion. Now, these are global figures, um, estimates l- r- largely uh, in U.S. dollars. So, I think that tablet figure is, is very cool because, I mean, that's really pointing to a, a, um, a sector of the audience for games that aren't even you know accessing it on their mobile phones. I'm talking about children here, I think. Tablet games account for 10% of the overall market, meaning that one out of every $10 spent on games is spent on tablets, which is pretty amazing. For those of you that are gamers, um, you'll probably, when we talk about games, think about um, consoles and PCs as being... The, the, the kind of top end consumer point of games. And these figures show that's just not true. Um, mobile, mobile gaming clearly dominates. But the, the um, console industry has been growing. In, in 2018, it increased 15.2%. And its annual profit um, is, is somewhere around 38 to 40 US billion per year, possibly even higher now. The PC games market, uh, this involves both desktop and laptop devices. This uh, this accounts for around 25%, so one quarter of the global games market. That's that's pretty important. One uh, in every four dollars spent on video games is for is is spent for the PC. Now this also includes um, download games, um, box games, but also browser games, and that's that's still a thing. Facebook games is still um, a major uh, contributor to the industry, uh, and you know we we know from from studies that it's it's largely women playing games on Facebook and largely um, uh, middle to to, to late age women. Revenues are also up uh, for the PC games industries, and and they have they have been growing for the better part of the decade. Games revenue, particularly in the mobile sector, is not just pure sales of games, but includes a huge amount of virtual commodities, power ups, unlocks, extra content, weapon and character skins. These are just some of the massive market of virtual commodities that are part of the the creative components uh, of the games industry. These are often called microtransactions, and, and I really think that's a bad term. 
We should just be thinking about them in terms of transactions. These are purchases, they are objects being purchased, and um, they're not micro, right? They're massive. The, the numbers here are enormous. And I don't I, whether it, whether it costs twenty five cents for a for a, a loot crate or, or a dollar for a skin or ten dollars for a DLC pack or whatever. Th- these these are not micro transactions. These are sales. They're also hugely important to the games industry and its investors and attention and scrutiny to them have increased recently as governments and public institutions begin to really take the the, the games media industry seriously and start to regulate it as they have regulated other types of um, entertainment creative industries. Historically, it's important to to think about games and, and where they sit in relation to other media. The dominant media of the 19th century was clearly the novel, uh, the written word. The dominant media of the 20th century was clearly started out as film and probably ended up, or was probably started out as radio, to be honest, and then and then and then film um, and television. And television is 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 still up there, but I think um, you know, predicting ahead, the dominant media of the 21st century. Um, is is going to be video games, and I'm and I'm taking uh, this kind of observation from uh, Dyson and 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 uh, Saucier's uh, history of video games in sixty four objects, which is a, a great book. So let's think about um, how games get made for a minute, and the and the kind of operation of the industry and how it's transformed uh, over the last two decades. We're going to look at the historical development of the studio system over the next couple of lectures, and we're going to look at how the industry has, has developed and, um, you know, in the, from the, the 60s and 70s, the 80s, 90s, early thousands, 2000s. So this is just a really quick, brief overview to situate you in thinking about the industry going forward. Video games um, inherited the studio production system from radio, film, and television. And this means that um, at, the, at the start of this um, linear production model, you get developers working in a studio. So video game development just basically has been dominated by the studio system, it replicated the, the film, television, publication system. This is the same as software creation and many other creative industries are kind of caught in, in, this, in this model. And, it's, and it's, it's thought of as a linear industrial production model, moving from creators at one end to consumers at the other. And of course, if you know anything about the internet, you know that this linear model has been totally disrupted by the rise of consumer power and the and the, the the changes that the internet has brought, but still we've got, we've got this legacy system that we're dealing with, and 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 part of that system is of course publishers. Many studios are actually owned by video game publishers, like um, Electronic Arts um, or Activision Blizzard, and many public uh, many studios um, developers have specific relationships with publishers who fund the development process. This, of course, is complicated by hardware manufacturers. So some hardware manufacturers also operate like publishers and developers or have publishing companies or publishing arms and in-house development studios. I'm thinking particularly here at Nintendo, but, but there are different iterations with regards to, to Sony and Microsoft. That then brings us to the distributors. And for the most part of the history of video games, um, distribution was physical. This meant that um, publishers have complicated relationships with distributors and retail outlets, what we might call the bricks and mortar stores. For example, in the US, the retail chain Walmart has enormous power in the video games market because they can control what is sold on their shelves across that country. The biggest change for the industry 
uh, in the last two decades has been the rise of digital distribution. So the elimination of the physical component of the sales of video games. Some companies still retain this. I mean, it's interesting to see even with the latest generation of Nintendo uh, and the Nintendo Switch, you're still working on a cartridge system. And of course, that's that's clearly you know designed to try and combat um, intellectual property theft and, and piracy. But at the same time, the availability of uh, affordable digital downloads has reduced piracy in the video games industry. It hasn't eliminated it, but it's definitely reduced it because it's made games more accessible and more affordable. And of course, mobile app stores, right, which are basically you know digital game stores. Um, but we're still in this hybrid situation. We haven't eliminated bricks and mortar uh, entirely. This brings us, of course, to the role of advertisers and marketing. You cannot underestimate just how much money is spent on advertising and marketing in the video game industry. It's an important and it's a powerful creative industry in itself, but also in the way that it contributes to how non-gamers and casual players come to an understanding of of game media. I noticed it a few years back, but... it, it. it was in, I was in Melbourne at the time and I was just taken by the number of, you know, large uh, AAA titles, which are the kind of the big games, um, and their advertising on buses, you know, and billboards. There was definitely a, few cha- a change a few years ago where we saw an, a massive uh, increase in the spending on physical media for game advertising. Then at the end of this historical linear production model are players. And players are often underestimated in this system. You know, I'll talk in the future about how digital distribution has changed this. And once um, players were simply thought of as the endpoint, the consumer. And all that mattered was the number of consumers. And so players themselves and players' investment and player communities were often disregarded. But digital distribution, particularly Steam, changed that dramatically. That also had flow-on effects because players began to create content on YouTube, uh, on Twitch, uh, on Facebook, blogs, podcasts, you name it, right? There is an enormous degree of player communities who produce content. Now that feeds back into the system as promotional material. Similarly, we have um, the rise of independent game designers who are empowered by players, um, whether it's through Kickstarter or the Greenlight system when it's on Steam when it first emerged. But we get you know, what's called independent game designers who are not funded by the publishers, but instead funded directly by the players themselves. This creates a huge amount of non-linearity in the system. The internet shifted the, the conditions of this global creative industry, introducing non-linearity and direct audience feedback into the production chain. Steam meant that you could start publishing games before they were finished and you could get feedback from your players. Right? That, 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 that is just in, an incredible development. So that totally changes the notion of what a product in this game media industry even is. Industries, uh, sorry, uh, indies and developers can then also bypass publishers and bypass the physical stores and and publish their games and distribute their games via Steam. And we're we're increasingly seeing diversity in the marketplace with uh, other online stores like the Epic Store, uh, UPlay. There's a whole range of them, and so this has a a, a massive shift again on this. Um, uh, this industry. Now, because we see indies and we see um, independent developers working with players, players and their involvement in the promotional material and the cultural production then start to be able to direct attention towards developers who are working within the traditional studio system. We see, you know, you're able to cho- uh, to tweet directly or contact on Facebook or, um, you know, 
organize uh, petitions and provide feedback via Reddit and things like that that plug directly into the main um, production chain. Uh, similarly, we are you know seeing players having uh, organi- organized um, feedback to publishers. Right, one of the one of the main things that we've seen recently in recent years is is players pushing back against companies like EA and pushing back against predatory consumer practices. So that's that's a that's a really big summary of of kind of the the major changes that the industry has has gone through, you know, over the past forty years. And we're going to break that down much further uh, over the course of the subject and, and talk about it in more detail. So this this might be of, of, of less interest. This next part to um, students outside this this subject and, and folks just watching this video because I'm I'm going to be talking now a little bit more closely about the structure of the subject and to start to, to take into details of the learning uh, assessments. This subject uh, involves three learning assessments, which all have uh, um, elements of analysis of game media texts or paratexts. Paratext is an important term. It, it, it means a text about a text. And, and I'm going to talk more about that next week. But you can think about game media advertising. You can think about merchandise as a paratext. It's a text talking about another text or related to that text. As part of this subject, you are going to develop what's called a digital artifact. In fact, you're going to be developing two. You're going to be working on a digital artifact um, for your individual project. And you're going to be working on a digital artifact as a group. Think uh, if you've not done one of these um, digital artifacts in, in other subjects in, in the, the, the Bachelor of Communication and Media at Wollongong, you can, you can think of a digital artifact simply as a project. It's something that you're supposed to be working on each week throughout the course. And it can be anything, right? You know, it can be a cosplay. It can be, it can be a game. It can be um, a a podcast. It can be a video essay. It can be a a visual essay. um, The the point is that you are going to acquire and demonstrate digital literacies and skills in conceptualizing and developing publicly available work. That is work that isn't. It doesn't. uh, So there's a there's an important disconnect in many instances between the the critical analysis that you're going to be doing and, and, and providing in your blogs and things and the actual artifact itself. The main thing about the artifact is that it, that it has meaning and utility. And then in the assessment, when it comes to the assessment, you're going to reflect on that in terms of the, the critical analysis and the, the analytical framework. I'll talk much more about what all this means um, in the chutes. I'm just kind of laying the groundwork um, for the chutes and, and thinking about um, the, the, the digital artifact um, ahead of that. Many of you, many of you have going to have done um, earlier BCM subjects um, and have done uh, digital artifacts in those subjects. But we also have students outside the BCM and outside the digital and social media major who are going to be new to this concept. And, and this, you know, just speaking to you guys directly for a second, I think the important thing is to, to make, to send your tutor uh, an email and, uh, or a DM on Twitter and arrange a time for a, a one-on-one consult to just, just talk about what a digital artifact is and um, how to build up skills in preparing for that. Because a digital artifact is not an assessment that you can leave to the last minute or the last week. It's a project that you need to demonstrate that you're working on over the course of the subject and contribute to weekly, if not daily. And you'll be pitching your project in week three um, via a video blog, and you'll be um, providing a, a beta report on your progress midway through the semester, also via a, a, a video that's embedded in your blog. Digital artifacts, you know, as I said before, you know, can include video essays, uh, audio essays, um, social media platforms, services. It could be a Discord um, server. Uh, it could be a, an esports challenge. 
you know, the, the idea is that, the, that your imagination can take flight here and, and really, really become experimental uh, in bringing your knowledge together um, and, and synthesizing your knowledge of the, the subject lectures and readings and putting that into a creative digital expression that we call a, a digital artifact. Innovative approaches and projects are encouraged and all other ideas and approaches should be discussed with your tutor. Uh, when it comes to assessment, it's best to think about limiting the audiovisual material. You know, I've, uh, I've had DAs for this subject with, you know, 10 hours of podcasts submitted um, and extensive video essays submitted. But we're not given a lot of time to mark these. And so... When it comes to marking, you have to do a highlights reel, you know, or, or a highlights package or review the timestamps for when we should be checking in on these things. So have that in mind um, as we go forward. One of the th great things about the BCM is that you're able to um, contribute to your digital, art digital artifact across multiple subjects. For example, uh, you might be doing BCM 206 or BCM 325 at the same time as doing BCM 215, um, which is this subject. And and so you could build on your single digital artifact across multiple subjects, but there is a particular focus for the DA in in this subject. And that is that in some way, your artifact has to engage in a critical analysis of a game media text or paratext. That's, that's an important element and, and one that you have to consider going forward with your, with your DA for this subject. And, 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 it, and it speaks both to the individual and, and to the group. The other important element um, is, of course, the analytical framework. And I'm going to be talking about this ad nauseum until everyone gets it. Uh, in this subject, because this is the most important thing that you are going to do in your digital artifact. Because when you submit your artifact, you're also going to be submitting uh, an, uh, an essay. So the DA focus involves a critical analysis of a game, media, text, or paratext using a triangulated analytical framework from concepts taken from the subject lectures and readings. This is super important, so, right? So I'm going to be presenting a whole bunch of concepts over, over the next few weeks. You're going to get access to, to more detail to those concepts and other concepts in the readings and materials for the subject. And you pick three in order to create an analytical framework for, for passing through, you know, passing the, the media text through this framework and thinking about that media text in this way. So a great example is the reading from, from week four, which is written by um, uh, my colleague, uh, Ted Mitchu and myself, called Histories of Internet Games and Play, Space, Technique, and Modality. Now, in this article, we, this, we demonstrate exactly what I'm trying to get you to do, which is to pick three, tech, three um, concepts to engage with a media, a game media text. In, 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 the, in the article, we're talking about um, internet games. And we're talking about internet games in terms of the technique, right? The, the not just the technologies, but the softwares, the approaches, that kind of thing involved in playing these games. And what's interesting about an analytical framework is that when you talk about one concept, you're often invoking to, you know, the other two concepts or three or four, depending on how many you have, to talk about that, right? So when we talk about the technologies involved in internet games, we're often talking about the spaces in which those games are played and the modality, right? The way in which those games are played. You know, internet games, you know, frequently are multiplayer, um, frequently are massively multiplayer. And they're played in different types of spaces around the world, whether they're private spaces like, you know, um, you know, games rooms and study rooms and bedrooms, that kind of thing, or kind of semi, you know, so social spaces like the, the, um, the family lounge room or public spaces like internet cafes and PC bongs. So well, I'm, I'm going to talk heaps more about this um, in, in the future, but I just wanted to kind of lay the, the, the idea here 
that you are you are going to be drawing on these lectures. You're going to be drawing out the theories and the concepts and the ideas and creating a framework for engaging in media analysis. Now, of course, you'll, you know, you'll be doing this in tandem with your own research, both to um, build out your, your, your background material uh, and help you examine the texts. But there's a, there's a really kind of useful summary here. Here's a kind of cheat sheet of the relevant concepts, theories, and ideas that we're going to look at uh, in, in this subject. I'm not going to read them all, but there's a, you know there's a couple of ones that stand out to me, you know in terms of narrative. Um, we're going to talk talk about cultural capital, um, participation, interpretation. We're going to look at ideas about uh, reading, like how how players read texts. Uh, we're going to talk about some some interesting theories that you might not have heard of before in terms of persona theory affect theory we're going to finish up um you know one of the concepts that 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 i've added to this series um because students were so interested in it last year is the concept of nostalgia so we'll we'll finish up that way but again you know you've got all these youtube videos you don't need to to watch them in order you can you can pick and choose based on these concepts that you want to engage with so a little bit more detail again um the, the the first assessment is learning assessment task one, and this is your this is going to be comprised of two blog posts. Blog post one is your pitch, and that's going to be a video blog, uh, two minute video blog that you're required to record and embed into a blog post uh, via YouTube, in which you are going to pitch your project. Uh, now, what you'll what you'll do is you will um, put this blog post on your personal blog, and then you're going to re-blog that uh, to the subject blog, gamecultures.blog, and, and you can check that out, and you can see all the work that students have done there uh, in the past. The pitch video will address the project plan, the media formats and technologies that you're going to use. Um, it will nominate an analytical framework, although you, you don't have to be locked in at this stage. And then the pitch will kind of, you know, think about the utility, like the usefulness of your approach in terms of um, engaging with the public audience, what your content schedule is going to be, what your feedback loop is going to be, uh, and its relevance to users. That is then followed by a, a second blog the following, wo- the following week in which you are going to comment on three people's pitches. Now, these are scheduled. You'll be, you'll be given a student that you have to comment on, and you'll put evidence of those comments in this blog post. But the blog post isn't just a straight copy-paste of the comments. Rather, it's a reflection on your own learning. And what we're looking for in the comments is evidence of engaging with the, the subject lectures and with the readings and commenting on those um, pictures in terms of what you understand about the, the concepts relevant. You know, for example, you might be interested in representation theory and you might be doing reading about how representation works. And so in your comments, you might say, hey, look, I, you know, I've, I've, I've been reading about representation and you might like to think about your DA in this way, right? So you're contributing knowledge and not just... Um, observing what they're doing and and saying, you know, hey, this is great. Thumbs up emoji, right? It's 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 much more detailed, much more engaged. And then in that in that second blog post, you're going to you know produce a, a kind of critical self reflection of, of what you've done, how you've engaged. It's super important that you take a look, for students in the subject. Um, you you take a look at the Moodle page for for this subject, which is our online learning management software. Um, you will see their assessment template cover sheets and the cover sheets have the grading rubric um, for the assessment. Now, I'll be t- talking about, all about this in the shoots, but it's, it's important that you know that there's a, a, a cover sheet and it's important you know that there's a really detailed grading rubric. Um, 
So the digital artifact then has a, a, a beta, right? So once you've got your first feedback from your pitch, you go away and do a bit more work on your DA, and then you present a, a four-minute video, which is your beta, which is much more of a progress report. And um, this also has a contextual blog post associated with it, and that's, that's due in week eight. And by this stage, right, you're more than halfway through the subject, and you should be really cooking with your DA, and it should be you know, already in public and should be getting public feedback in, in some way, whether it's you know, surveys or comments or tweets or however, right? You just need to show engagement with a public. And again, I'm not looking for evidence of hits, right? I'm not looking for you know, evidence of views or anything like that. I'm looking for quality of feedback over quantity. Um, that's more, much more important at this learning stage, right? Sure, when you go out and, you, and you're working uh, in industry, they, they're going to want to know how many hits you got, but that's, that's not part of the, the learning process. It's much more about the quality of engagement rather than the um, quantity. You're then going to have three posts that you are uh, commenting on, and responding to, and again, deploying your knowledge, and then you know providing a critical self-reflection. Right? And, and so we're very interested in the kind of things that you contributed, how you engaged. Did you go, did you go off and do further research in these, in these comments and provide really actionable feedback um, for the beta um, poster in terms of the feedback that you engaged with? So that's, that's all due in week eight. Another important element uh, of the subject is the group digital artifact. This is, this is, this is super important because uh, you know, you, you're, you're doing your own thing in your DA and group work is a, a great way of um, coming together and sharing knowledge and sharing learning and making sure that, you, that you're all on the same page when it comes to understanding the concepts, the ideas, and the theories in the lectures, and, and working collaboratively to apply that to a critical analysis of a, of a game media text. There are two components to the group digital artifact. The first is the artifact itself, um, and, and these will be due uh, from week 10 to week 13. Because in those weeks, we will also have the second component, which is your in-class presentation. So your DA should be about 10 minutes if it's an audio video or, or, or the equivalent in terms of words or, or a product or, or, or a project. And then in class, you'll be unpacking your critical analytical framework and explaining your DA to us in terms of the, the, the research that you've done, the analysis that you did, the, the theory that went into it and, and how you're deploying the knowledge that you develop in the subject um, to that DA. So uh, again, you can see examples of these on the subject blog. Um, they're supposed to be a lot of fun. They're, they're, they are uh, a chance to engage. You can do you know let's plays. You can do uh, reviews. You can do analysis, like straight up traditional analysis you can work on th a 3d printing project or a, a game or whatever like you know the, this is the great thing about the the, the digital artifact model this is super open-ended okay so this is this is bringing us um to to the close uh this week and i want to point out um uh two readings um that uh are really useful and um uh, they are both available um, on the the Moodle website. Uh, there's a reading for, for this week and a reading for next week. And I, I do recommend um, at least having a skim through those before engaging with the lecture um, because it's kind of anticipated in the lectures that, you, that you've done the readings for those weeks. Um, but please make sure to have a, a quick um, a quick squeeze at those uh, before the tutorials because we'll be talking a little bit about them in the tutes. You can uh, send any questions you have to me uh, at um, uh, via Twitter. Um, if you're a student in the subject, uh, please request a follow and I'll follow you. But my, my DMs are also open, so you can hit me up there. So if there's any, any questions about the content for the subject, um, that's a good place. We also have a subject Discord channel. 
So if you know what Discord is, then then you should be able to add that channel without problem. If you don't know what Discord is, it's basically a kind of social networking chat voice system, uh, a kind of mix of f- Facebook, Twitter, and, and Steam uh, for for games and games audiences. And 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 it's worth it's worth download. It's free. It's worth downloading and adding the channel and and having a, a look at that platform. So you can catch me on Twitter. You can catch me on Discord. If um, and that's just for you know for for for, for any you know subject related issues. If it's an administration issue, please use formal email um, for that. Uh, particularly if you want an extension for assessments and that kind of thing. I look forward to seeing you in the chutes, and thanks for playing.